We've got a great session for you this afternoon. If I can just give one last shout out for anybody at the back who fancies coming further forwards to join in the discussion, that would be fantastic. Uh, we're going to have four speakers and then some time for question and answer at the end. Um, we've got Dom, Goody, Hannah and Claire who are all going to outline different ways of thinking about this problem for you. Um, and I'm going to start by handing over to Dom. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to this session. We've got some tough competition next door. We've got Hugh and Jennifer and Penny, so it's fantastic to see you guys here. And uh, hello to everybody who's watching from the office, from their sofa, from wherever they are on the live stream. So great to have you all here. We're going to be talking about um, population health and thinking about improvement methods as they apply more broadly and thinking beyond some of the boundaries of traditional healthcare settings like our wards and outpatient clinics. Uh, in order to do that, I'm keen to get a bit of a sense of who's in the room and what your key focus is on. So we're going to run a couple of quick questions and we're going to do a bit of an improvement Mexican wave. A bit of a first here. Uh, so I am going to ask you a series of quick questions and we're going to get you to stand up when the answer applies to you and then sit back down and hopefully we'll create a little bit of a wave and understand who's in the room. In order to kick us off, we're going to do a non-work question. So my question to you is about high school reunions. How do you feel about them? And we've got three options. Really don't like them. I'm already washing my hair that night. I don't want to go. Yeah, I'm all right about going. I'm quite interested to see whether people have moved on from the 80s hairstyles. I'm kind of curious. Love them. Can't wait. I've already chosen my outfit. So one of those answers applies to you. Pick one. And in a moment, I'm going to get you to stand up and then sit back down once you've uh, seen your answer appear on the screen. OK, everyone got their answer? Good. All right, so how it's going to work is I'm going to press my button and that red dot is going to move along the screen. When it touches the box that applies to your answer, please stand up and then sit back down when the, the dot moves off the box. Is that clear? OK, let's see if this works. It goes quite slowly, so I hope you've got enough time. So think about your answer. When the dot hits your box, stand up, sit back down once the dot has moved on. Ready? Brilliant. Thank you. It worked. Give yourselves a round of applause. I think that worked quite well. OK, for those of you who couldn't see quite well, there was a lot of people who would be washing their hair. Let's just put it that way. OK, we've got two other quick questions. It relates a bit more now to why we're here today. So the next one is about your focus of what you're doing at the moment. And this isn't about your aspiration. It's about your current focus. So are you somebody who's working mainly in the disease treatment uh, recovery sphere? Are you thinking about management, self-management, uh, um, self-care? Or are you very much in the health promotion prevention end? Now, I know some people work in that space. We've also got carers, citizens, patients. But it's, it's about interpreting how this best sits for you as a question and answer. If you are somebody who works or thinks about your work across all of these boxes, that's fine. You can answer more than one question, uh, one answer, but you've got to sit down in between. So you've got a task there, OK? <laughs> all right, the dot's going to move. Have you got, got your answers ready? OK. Let's go. Brilliant. We've got an actual widespread of people. Hands up who put your hands up, uh, put, answered more than one question, that one answer there. OK, fantastic. So people working across span, spanning boundaries and thinking about work that's right in the sphere of provo promotion and prevention, which is excellent and the bit that we're really keen to focus on today. OK, last question before we move into the content. Thinking about the setting which you're focusing on in your work or your um, area of focus. Is that solely healthcare? Is that a mixture? Or are you working beyond the boundaries of healthcare very much? So have a look at the answer. Same format applies. Stand up when your uh, answer gets selected. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. Give yourselves a round of applause. So I, hope, I guess what I was trying to illustrate from that is we've already got people doing a lot of work in this space, and so we're not professing to be experts by any means on this stage. We just want to give you some examples of what we've been thinking about 
but it's fantastic to see that breadth because I think sometimes as improvers we can get quite narrow in our thinking around a microsystem, a ward, a clinic, an institution and here what we're really talking about is improvement method that goes beyond boundaries and thinking about prevention and people's social determinants of health. So um, I want to show you a couple of slides to frame and I'm the warm up act for these fantastic speakers here. The first one is this uh, picture of the fire service. Now, Michael Marmot, who's professor, uh, works for the uh, Institute of Health Equity, uh, put this slide up at his uh, a recent conference that he was at to a, a whole load of doctors and said, basically, if the fire service can do it, why can't we? And what he was talking about is how the fire service has gone beyond its typical work of um, putting out fires to thinking more about prevention of fires, thinking about smoking, working with young people and older people in communities, looking at falls and things that impact the wider determinants of health. And his entreaty to us as healthcare people was, we need to start thinking more broadly about our role. And the fact that you're in this room means that you're already people doing that. So I'm not going to dwell on the why. We're really talking about the how in this session. So you'll all well know that what keeps us healthy is beyond healthcare. Lots of things influence that around where we live, work, our homes, our uh, upbringing, lots of things that relate to that. And we're talking about a lot of that today around the improvement method. And our hypothesis around that is that some things that we do in a more healthcare improvement lens might well apply when we're trying to do this more broadly, but there might be some things that you need to think about or do differently as well, and we're hopefully going to showcase some of those. So I'm going to give you a quick framework that I've been thinking about when I've observed some of this work, and we've gone out and seen a lot of people doing this stuff. And I'm a bit of a theoretical learner, so for those of you who like frameworks, this one hopefully will help you, but then we'll get into the real practicalities with our two other speakers. So the first one is thinking about the population. I think when we um, often show this triple aim that many of you will be familiar with, we often think very much about care and we think about cost, but we don't always think about the population. And that's what we're talking about. How do we expand that to become an equal part of that triangle so that the triple aim is really fulfilled? And a model that we take over from research and evidence-based practice helps us here. Now, our speakers in a moment will talk about how they've retrospectively fitted their work into this model and how they've mapped it to other improvement techniques. But what I hope to show with this is that you really do need to start with the population. Often when we're developing improvement projects, we start with the service. We want to reduce did not attend appointments by X percent. And that's not starting with people or patients or their needs. And so you really do need to start with the population, the group that you want to try and tackle some of this work with and through. The second thing is very much similar to how we think about improvement. What is your intervention? But very much in this space, it's not likely to be something that's discrete or definable. It's often something that is complex and uh, has a multiple faceted approach to it. So thinking very clearly about how you might understand your intervention, I'll come back to that. And then the comparator is uh, somewhat diffuse when we're thinking about population health. So it can be trends over time, it can be benchmarking to others, but that is harder when we're thinking about improving population health. So here I'm urging you to think about, well, what, who are you comparing to who and what are you comparing? So that's about inequalities and equity. How do we look between groups of people and populations? And then thinking about outcomes, similarly to improvement work, there will be proxies uh, and uh, process measures to our outcomes, but having a focus on outcomes. So I think the two big differences here are really thinking about a population and our comparators bringing in health inequalities. So that's the first thing, start with the population. Uh, my second slide has been stolen from somebody who's very clever in Scotland, Graham McKenzie, who says, think big, start small. So whilst you might have a big aspiration for what you want to do, tackling poverty, homelessness, lots of things that impact people's health more widely, you and your sphere of influence and control can only do so much to start with. So whilst world peace is right out there as the aspiration, we need to think a bit more about where we might start to do some of our tests of change. So here this model looks at in inequalities in income, moved into thinking about unclaimed benefits, then moved into the pregnant population, and then thought about how women attend midwifery services and increasing uptake of um, healthy start vouchers. So um, working out what's in your sphere of influence and control is really important. 
And the third thing is around uh, understanding the nature of your challenge. Now, when we often do improvement work, we think about some of our problems being quite complicated or complex. But when you boil them down, they're often actually what we might determine as fairly simple problems, even though they feel hard when you're doing them. What do we mean by simple? Well, we mean there's often agreement about what the problem is, and we're pretty certain about what we need to do. It's an implementation issue. So, for example, a ventilator acquired pneumonia. There's a lot known about that problem, and there's a lot known about what we need to do to fix it. So, whilst it might be fairly hard in some settings to actually make change happen, it's not because we don't understand the problem, and it's not because we don't understand the solution well. So, that's a fairly simple problem. What we're thinking about here often with uh, the work we're doing is wicked or complex problems that are, that are sort of far out at that end. We see chaos on this map. I think that's probably a slight exaggeration, but it is about operating in that sphere of complexity. So two different types of quality improvement challenges. One about quality as a navigation. You have a checklist, you have a recipe, you know the path. If you follow it, you're likely to get to some kind of change or outcome. So that's quality as a navigation. What we're talking about here is often problems that are very difficult to solve because of the uncertainty and the complexity. And we're thinking about quality as an exploration. We don't necessarily have a roadmap. We don't always know where we're trying to get to or we have a vague idea. And the analogy often used in the literature is about raising a child. So the comparison being following a recipe versus raising a child. You have to adapt as you go. There's a lot of factors that will influence that along the way. You can't always predict what's going to happen. And I think it's really important when we're addressing these problems to be aware that these are the types of challenges that have these issues and how we tackle them differently. And my final slide really is to just say that I'm a big fan of W. Deming, who was a statistician, and it encompasses pretty much the things I've just said. He talked about having an appreciation of the system in which you're operating. So it's not just if I do something here, it impacts over there. Something like tackling obesity is a multi-systemic, multi-faceted problem. It looks really complicated. So understand the system you're working in. Think about the variation and my urge about thinking about inequalities and equity in that lens. Having a theory of knowledge and a theory of change of, to what you think might happen as a result of what you're doing applies to all improvement. And the human behaviour thing, I think, is particularly pertinent in the population health sphere because we're talking about not just patients, but people, citizens, living their lives and interacting with a complex set of agencies and stakeholders. So understanding who behaves and how they behave in that way is really important. So that's my framework. I've gone through that at pretty high speed, but I'm hoping that that sets the ground for the, the next speakers to come. And just to say, I think this can all feel quite complex and complicated, and I really hope the practical examples of how people are using improvement method to make this kind of change happen will be really helpful. So I'll hand over to Goody and Hannah. Right, thank you. Thanks, John. Hi, hello, everyone. My name is Didi Singh, and I am the Integrated Child Health Quality Improvement Fellow at East London Foundation Trust. And my lovely colleague, Hannah Zhu, and I are paediatric registrars, and we've been working together to think about how to tackle population health problems from within the NHS. Um, I'd like to just thank Dom and team for actually asking us to come and talk to you today. As you'll see, our project is not very impressive but I hope that it will help to illustrate some of the threads that Dom has talked about. Um, and actually, I've been really grateful for this opportunity to think about this a bit more deeply, um, because this is a complex problem, and I think it's something we're gonna face more and more, and we need to have more time to think about this type of thing. So, Hannah and I are first and foremost clinicians, and so that means our daily experience is human beings, it's patients in clinical settings, whether it's the emergency department, or whether it's um, you know, the outpatient wards, um, or, um, uh, you know, just the clinics. And you might ask then, how is it that we have come to be involved in population health and quality improvement? Well, this is why. In the UK as a whole right now, 30% of children are living in poverty. And actually in the boroughs that Hannah and I work in, so that's Newham and in Southwark respectively, the statistic is more like 50%. That's one in every two children that you see walking down the street. Now, that kind of statistic would be shocking anywhere in 2019, but it's all the more appalling when you think that we are in the fifth richest economy in the world. Now, Philip Alston, who is the UN Rapporteur for Poverty, has said of this country that we should be finding it really difficult to be looking ourselves in the mirror when we have equality, inequality at such stark levels. But poverty is more than just statistics, isn't it? 
When I see one in two children in my clinic and they're suffering the effect of poverty, the fact is that it has real world health effects on these children. And the issue is that we know that poverty is the single most important determinant of health for these children. It is the thing that is going to affect their health outcomes, their developmental outcomes, their educational outcomes, their social outcomes. It has a massive effect on them. And the fact is it's making these children sick. I can't tell you the number of times that I have sat across from a patient and I've had to look a parent in the eye and know that the most useful thing that I can do for them that day is probably give them all the money I have in my purse. And I have done that on more than one occasion in Newham. And I can't tell you how shocking it is to see with increasing frequency the kinds of diseases that you would have thought existed in the Victorian era and should not be existing now in the 21st century. So things like rickets, that's what we're seeing now. So the point is it is having a, a real life effect on, on the kids of today. And more and more admissions to emergency departments up and down this country are from families who are desperate. They have literally nowhere else to go. And as they descend further and further into poverty, their children are getting sicker and sicker. And they are presenting with symptoms of headaches, tummy pain, skin problems, infections, anxiety, all of which have been caused by the conditions in which they grow, live, and work, the social determinants of health. The point I am trying to make here is that we have an already overstretched NHS that is being further stretched by population level health problems turning up at its doorstep every single day. And it is clinicians like Hannah and I who have to deal with it. Without being given the training to know what to do and without having adequate pathways to be able to direct these patients. So you can imagine, it's pretty overwhelming, it's pretty distressing to be a clinician in that context, but it doesn't make sense at a population level either, right? I mean, the implications for the public health services and for population health on a general level for this country should be obvious. What are we going to do about it? Well, within the roles that we, as clinicians, uh, the roles that we have within the NHS, how can we actually have any impact on child poverty? Now, this kind of question of what health professionals can do about big social problems is something that I've been interested in for years, and it's a PhD that I'm kind of working up, and this is some of the work that we've been doing on it. Um, but one of the ways that clinicians can have an effect is through service improvement efforts, so quality improvement. But what does that look like, and does it actually make a difference? To help answer those questions, I'm going to hand over to Hannah to tell, us, tell you about the project that we did. Thank you. Um, so as Goody said, um, we as frontline clinicians um, want to show a project as an example of how doctors on the front line can do something and do our part in tackling child poverty using QI methods. So the problem statement, as stated by Goody, is that although um, doctors do really care about poverty and understand this is the most important social determinant for our patients, um, when surveying my colleagues and also the Royal College of Pediatrics did a national survey, it was very much apparent that child health professionals felt powerless when faced with child poverty. So what do we do about this? Um, in a small DGH, we piloted a project using the model for improvement, which we're all familiar with, um, to tackle child poverty. And we've also used the, um, retrospectively mapped it onto the PICO model, but it is really helpful to think about it in this way because there's plenty of innovation in both models. Um, so from a population perspective, the population we were looking at was children less than 18 years attending acute pediatrics who were living in poverty. And poverty is quite hard to define, but we took a clinical approach using the Townsend definition of children and families who lack the resources to obtain the diet, the activities, um, and have the, the living environment that is expected of their society. Um, and the aim of our project, and that had to be within our sphere of influence as doctors, was for doctors in acute pediatrics to firstly ask about child poverty and be equipped to offer the resources um, to help these patients. The interventions part of um, the project maps really nicely onto change ideas. It's not quite shown that on the screen, but, um, but the interventions we tested through doing PDSA cycles. And these included things like how to screen for poverty, co-designed with patients and colleagues, um, as well as how you discuss poverty 
and um, design of resources in an accessible way for patients. Um, the comparison part of this project um, we used as baseline measures. So at baseline, 0% of doctors in acute pediatrics screened for poverty or offered resources. Um, the outcomes uh, maps nicely onto the measures part of the model for improvement. So our process measures were, firstly, percentage of doctors per shift asking about child poverty and our history taking. Secondly, percentage of doctors who were aware of local resources for child poverty. And thirdly, the number of um, resources offered per shift. The outcome measures we looked at were, again, on a small scale, individual patients, feedback on receiving the resources following these discussions, and also patient stories who we followed up three to six months later, looking at their health outcomes. So just to remind you, the aim of our project was for, by August 2019, over 80% of pediatricians in acute pediatrics to ask about child poverty and offer local resources when appropriate. We did achieve this in our small um, DGH in Kingston, um, and that went from 0% to 84% of doctors asking about poverty, which was sustained over a period of three to three months. And also, it went from 0% to 100% of doctors who were aware of local resources. Certainly myself and all of the project champions were offering multiple resources per shift for patients who we felt needed it. Um, as an example of uh, some of the resources we were given, um, is the leaflet on the, uh, the right-hand side of the screen mm -hmm. <laughs> for you guys. Um, so this is a one to 3 approach co-designed with uh, patients and families who are living in poverty, um, as well as doctors and nurses um, and social workers um, who were aware of these resources. So um, this, this approach um, is a model for discussion and it just starts the conversation about these social determinants with, pa with patients aiming to empower families to go and do something about this. So number one is things that increase income, and these include things like citizens' advice and Christians Against Poverty, offering job clubs, how to live on a tight budget, money courses, and the community to do so. Number two um, are to provide essentials, and these include things like food bank, shelter for um, homelessness and housing problems, as well as home start for young families. These are all on a national scale as well. Um, number three are things that improve participation, tackling the social, social isolation side of poverty. And these include things like youth groups, community groups, um, and also family counselling. And the effect of this on our patients um, was quite overwhelming for me. Um, certainly, um, I was overwhelmed by the thanks. Thank you for exploring this area of our lives. And, um, and also, it just really enhanced our like, doctor-patient relationships and made it so much more meaningful than just addressing their upper respiratory tract infection or their asthma. Looking at patient stories, um, an example of one of these um, is a boy who came in with diabetes, um, with awful diabetes control, who was living in poverty and couldn't afford the diet or participate in any activities or sports. So we took a holistic approach to this gave him lots of resources, as well as address the diabetes side of things with his nurses. And actually, three to six months later, he had improved um, outcomes in terms of diabetes control in the form of HbA1c, and also improved school attendance. And they had access to many of the resources, such as family counselling, because his parents had split up recently. And addressing all of this has been really meaningful for us and has really resonated with many paediatricians that we've spoken to across London. We've presented this at a few national conferences and the project is currently running at four hospitals in London, um, including areas of really high social deprivation, such as Newham and North Middlesex. So handing back over to Goody. Oh, I don't need that. Thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks. So... Um, so, as you can see, um, QI is of some use when it comes to uh, tackling population health within the NHS. We've just put this in for QI porn more than anything else. We didn't really think you wanted to really look at this driver diagram. But anyway, um, <laughs> the mantra of QI is to think big and to act small, which is what Dom said before, right? And we think we tick that box, right? Because you can't think any bigger than trying to deal with child poverty in the UK. And I think you'd be hard pressed to act any smaller than the very humble QI project that we um, did ourselves. But the real question is, is it making a difference uh, to the people that we saw? And the fact is that QI 
you know, traditionally comes from um, a reductionist way of thinking, right? It comes, borrows from industry, it borrows from biomedicine, and it, it's very simplistic. It thinks that factor A will cause event B, and that event B therefore results in C, and if you can just intervene between A and B, you can probably prevent C, right? Well, we all know that the social determinants don't behave like that, and Dom's already talked about how complicated all of that is, and if we really try to map everything out, it would be mind-boggling, and that's the problem, isn't it? As clinicians within the NHS trying to address population health problems, the issue is that the tools that we have open to us are designed for the individual, not for the population. And so it's complexity and the very system that we operate in that is making our work really, really difficult. Because the solutions that we have open to us are necessarily limited by the power that we have, our sphere of influence. You know, we came up with a signposting tool which we know is not going to be able to deal with the systemic issue at hand there. And actually, if anything, it's probably going to just shift the problem elsewhere. You know, we're gonna be making referrals to services and there are limited services out there, right? We know we're living in a, a country with austerity at the moment. So it feels unsatisfying. The system, the NHS, is not built to think about population level health problems. It doesn't have the right outcomes, it doesn't have the measures. And I'm sorry to say this, but I'm not sure that our managers and leaders are properly turned on yet to thinking about these down the line, longer term, out of sight impacts, prevention. As we see it, there are three main stumbling blocks with doing this kind of work. The first is data. What data sets are actually easily available to me as a clinician so that I could even start thinking about how to set up a QI project like this? There are no joined data sets, let alone ones that are stratified for the social determinants. So how can I possibly identify the right population, let alone target them? And remember, I only have access to the patients that happen to turn up at my door. Second, and related, is the issue of impact. We don't know how much impact our project has actually had with our patients, because we don't have the tools to be able to know whether their outcomes have actually gotten any better. Given that we are in an a NHS landscape that is increasingly demanding of us business plans and quantifiable outcomes, how on earth can I justify the work that we have been doing when I am not able to measure those things? When I'm not able to tell you um, the effects of those interventions, which by their very nature are complex, they have their effects at multiple levels and they operate over a long period of time. And third, is the issue of professional remit and capability. Now the truth is that Hannah and I are interested in public health and we're interested in QI. So we're not the average clinician. And what I've been looking at in my PhD is to dig around into this issue of what happens when professional roles and responsibilities um, are pushed, when we're starting to work in this integrated way and we're trying to think about the social determinants of health. And obviously I'm still collecting data, but already I'm starting to see this really interesting conundrum. It's well known that QI does not speak to the hearts of clinicians. It somehow misses the point for a lot of clinicians. And Mary Dixon Woods wrote in the BMJ not so long ago about how healthcare improvement needs to be improved if it's going to actually live up to its positive potential. And what I'm finding is that, you know, um, people are telling me that it's removed, it feels remote, it feels unrelated to the core activity of clinicians, which is to make people's health better. And yet, with some of the work that I'm doing in Newham around multidisciplinary teaching and engagement around social issues like poverty, I'm finding that um, therapists who would have said to you at the beginning of the session that they would never have touched QI with a barge pole, they are spontaneously and organically coming up with initiatives that are QI by nature, if not QI by name. And I feel like there's something there, there's something in there, and there's something about QI work that is actually aligned with what people care about, with their values, which I think is what can help something to be sustainable and to be embedded. But in recognizing that fact, I feel like this is a really key important finding for both of us. It's that for these clinicians and for these patients that we are dealing with, the important income, uh, outcomes for them are not the pennies that are gonna be saved and are not the admissions that you're going to avoid. For them, the really key thing that happens is the, the clinical relationship. What happens is enabling a clinician to be able to help the patient in front of them. What happens is the patient feeling heard and validated and supported by the clinician. And there's that solidarity between both sides because everybody knows that we're working in a constrained system. 
And although we have some of that nuanced qualitative data, I don't think a business plan has ever, ever asked for that kind of information in terms of trying to justify why a, an in intervention should exist. So to close, um, I would say that working to tackle population health within the NHS is exciting, but there are clearly huge challenges. And our take home message is really this. Unless systems, and the systems that we work in, actually start to empower and enable clinicians to address the problems that they really care about with the data, with the pathways, with the institutional support to be able to do so, then you're missing out on that huge potential of the people who work within it to actually do good in the real world. Thank you. That was a, a really great um, practical example of, of making a difference uh, in, in real time uh, for those we care for. I would like to um, offer perhaps a different lens uh, to look at these issues. I spent 15 years in national quality improvement posts before I came to my current role. Um, and I'd like to share the U, which is a framework that I have found phenomenally helpful in thinking about these big challenges. Um, the framework has come from MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and it builds on the work of Peter Senge, who many of you may have read The Fifth Discipline. Um, and that word work was taken to the next stage uh, by Otto Sharma, who interviewed hundreds of improvement leaders to get to the bottom of this, uh, this discussion that I think we've been having in all sorts of uh, fora today about how is it that certain tools and techniques work in some places but not in others? And at the heart of it uh, is the answer that won't surprise you, and we've also been talking about all day, which is it's about the people in the midst of it the facilitators, the change agents, and their quality of awareness, awareness of the contextual issues, ability to bring people with them, awareness of the real system challenges. And so the you invites us to go on a journey, a journey where we really make a difference and can tackle some of these big problems but we need to be doing it thoughtfully and carefully to co-produce that change and use our tools and techniques lightly. So it's about gathering people around an issue and building a common intent. And before we go anywhere with our tools and techniques, we need to be thinking about listening, deep listening. And there are some fabulous uh, uh, tools, creative tools that have come from the Health Foundation. There's a wonderful set of postcards about how could we do that differently? How can we have those conversations with people creatively? How do we hear the voices in the system we don't normally hear? And when we listen, listen and listen, we hear the voices of the marginalized, and that's where equity comes in. Thinking about proportionate universalism, how do we provide the services in the places they're most needed? How do we listen uh, to those who are, are most disadvantaged in our society? And then present thing is about being still being truly present to the issue, working collaboratively and collectively, and saying, we're not gonna rush ahead with a solution here until we really understand what's going on and what the thing is that's going to make the most difference. So often, we'll, we'll change an issue, we'll change flows, we'll change our outpatient systems, but actually, the thing that's the real problem is the fact that the bus routes have changed, or the fact that people can't actually afford to get uh, to where we're asking them to. So how do we co-create those solutions and prototype them rapidly? 
So all those wonderful tools and techniques that we've been hearing about, the co-design, the um, experience-based co-design that we've been talking about in one session, and uh, uh, the, the fabulous QI methods that you're well experienced with, they absolutely have a place, but it's about not starting the journey with a methodological lens, but starting the journey with conversations and relationships and looking at using our expertise in, in a timely way uh, in that journey. I was looking at the, the, the PICO model we've been talking about, thinking, well, where does that fit? And I think it does, you know, identifying that population. Who is it that you're working with? Um, but then being really thoughtful before we get to intervention, comparison, outcome, and not rushing that phase that's about uh, deep listening, real understanding, and an openness uh, to the voices that perhaps tell us things we didn't want to hear, um, an openness to the voices that, uh, that come from a different space, those who disagree with us, and to be really thoughtful about sitting with that dissonance and not acting until we've built uh, the relationships and collaborations that we need to go forward. So I find this quote uh, quite... Um, I guess inspiring and unsettling in equal measure um, because I uh, think of my interior condition on an average day and it, uh, it, it may not be entirely uh, serene as I, uh, <laughs> as I approach what I'm doing but I think there's something really important. I was delighted to see the mindfulness for QI session today because I think how we show up is critical to all of this work um, and just as Otto Sharma found in his early work, we as change makers cannot factor ourselves out of the change that we're facilitating. So I just wanted to give you some examples of a few interveners over the years. Uh, I have a bit of a thing about women's history, uh, telling the stories of, of those who've perhaps been unheard. Um, population health is not new. Um, I work for a small charity, and this is our 130th year. And these are our three founders. They set up the Queen's Nursing Institute in Scotland. They also set up the Edinburgh Cookery School. The Edinburgh Cookery School was about emancipating women and giving them skills so that they could get paid employment to bring incomes into their families by cooking in schools and hospitals and other institutions, as well as learning to feed their own families well. The Queen's Nursing Institute Scotland was developed to train nurses to support the sick poor, those who couldn't afford the doctor. And these women worked together uh, with the Edinburgh Needle Women's Guild, who worked to sew close to create clothing uh, for, uh, for those who couldn't afford to buy it. So we're standing on the shoulders of giants. And I'd like to introduce to you three contemporary uh, social reformers. Uh, in 2017, we reintroduced the Queen's Nurse title after a 50-year break. Uh, Scotland's new Queen's Nurses are improvement leaders, um, and they go on a nine-month programme, perhaps exploring some of their own, uh, their own role as change makers and how they are showing up and making a difference. Uh, this is Jess. Uh, she works in the custody suite uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, it's one of the busiest custody suites in Scotland. And the nursing team uh, tackle all sorts of uh, challenges. You know, you never know what's uh, going to appear through the door next. Most of them are mental health and physical health trained. Um, Edinburgh has a peculiar habit of um, injecting things that shouldn't be injected. 
Um, and so they wound up with all sorts of hideous necrotic wounds as well as the um, psychological effects of whatever substances may have been ingested. But what the nursing team noticed was that on the Sunday afternoons, uh, there were folk languishing in cells waiting for court appearances on Monday and Tuesday who had been stabilized on methadone, who had had more to eat and drink and more sleep than they'd had in a very long time and were ready to have conversations about recovery, about next steps, about how they move their lives forward. But on a Sunday afternoon, there's no one really to have that conversation. Uh, so the team worked with us um, and we arranged for SACRO, which is a community justice organization, uh, to work with the nursing team, to be available to have conversations with people um, at times that they were ready, not at times when agencies normally work. And that program's now been taken forward and funded by Police Scotland so that everybody has the opportunity uh, for a conversation uh, which is followed up uh, after they have been through the custody suite. Uh, this is Hilary, um, who works with uh, refugee and asylum-seeking women uh, in Glasgow. Uh, she identified that very few asylum-seeking women were accessing uh, antenatal care, uh, particularly antenatal uh, parent education. But when she listened deeply to what it was that women wanted, they didn't actually want parent craft in the usual way. They weren't concerned about giving birth, they weren't concerned about breastfeeding, but what they were concerned about was how to access NHS services in a strange country when they didn't speak English. So she worked with the British Red Cross, um, with Tara, who support trafficked women, um, to bring women together with whispering translation, uh, women who would sit alongside and, and, and whisper into people's ears, um, brought them together in a space where they could bring their other children with them, um, and the Red Cross paid bus fares, uh, to give women an opportunity to explore the things they wanted to explore in the antenatal period. Um, but that was a co-produced initiative. It wasn't about, you know, the problem is you're not accessing the service. It was a completely different conversation. Uh, this is Rachel, who works as a parish nurse in Dundee. Uh, this is a, a post-funded, uh, uh, in the third sector, it's not an NHS post, but Rachel has convened um, an extraordinary group of agencies to come in and support the homeless uh, who come into the church every day for lunch. They have podiatry services, dental services, who all come to where people gather. And because she doesn't work in the system, she has been able to listen to what it is that people really need and enable that to happen. It turned out that many of the guys who wanted to get into recovery really struggled because they couldn't get the support they needed day after day. Uh, so they produced a recovery roadmap, and all the agencies, all the voluntary sector groups, all contributed uh, to plotting where somebody could get recovery support every day of the week when they needed it. And they produced that in a pocket-sized map with really simple graphics, because a lot of the guys concerned didn't have mobile phones, and they uh, s often struggled to read. And that information has been so useful, but that was what the guys themselves were asking for. And now uh, the, the convening of that group has continued, and the group is called Bridges for Hope, and all the agencies who support the homeless in Dundee get together on a regular basis, and they come to the steeple church uh, because Rachel was the facilitator, the person who, who was the grit in the oyster, really, to bring everybody together. Um, and it's great to see a, a third sector role taking the lead uh, for a marginalised community. So in this you journey, what's in the toolkit? We've seen so much today uh, that helps us in that journey, and it's just brilliant. It feels like there's a real golden thread um, of conversations that, that build. Uh, so we have um, our quality improvement tools and our PDSA cycles, and we've heard uh, how useful they have been in a, an inequalities project. 
the U lab as well as the Q labs. The U lab is the theory U uh, labs that happen globally and you can find them on the Presencing Institute website um, as well as the Q labs are all there to support us and the many community engagement tools, some of which we've discussed today, uh, but others are, are certainly around uh, that you will have used and your uh, third sector or social care colleagues will be well familiar with. A couple I just wanted to highlight. Firstly, experience-based co-design. If you weren't in the workshop this morning, um, I would really encourage you to uh, check out the Point of Care Foundation website, work that came from the King's Fund um, and it now exists as a, a separate charity. Of course, all of this chimes really strongly with Helen Bevan's work around being health and care radicals, the School for Change agents. But if uh, somehow that, uh, that isn't on your radar, I would strongly encourage you to look at that because I think that's how we are thoughtful about our facilitation skills and the difference we make. I'm missing a slide. Okay, there's a slide missing um, about uh, being more pirate. Some of you might have been at the Nesta conference uh, in the summer um, where Sam Conliffe spoke uh, about the pirates and the pirate code. And I was quite inspired because it was about being, you know, being a disruptor. Sometimes we actually need to do that. Um, and so if you haven't seen um, Be More Pirate, uh, uh, all good booksellers sell it, and I would uh, commend that to you. So just to conclude, I would challenge you to think about who are you? What role do you play in population health in developing? Are you a pirate? Are you going to get out there and, and rewrite the rules? A pioneer, a social reformer, um, a rebel with a cause? Um, how are you going to uh, arrive uh, when you get back and think about your next challenge. What is your U-shaped journey? Do please stay in touch. We'd all love to hear from you and the various things that you're doing. Um, thank you very much. You need to get rid of things. hope you've all thought up some queries, questions, or comments, because we'd now like to go to the audience um, and offer you the opportunity to discuss these issues a little bit further for the rest of the nine minutes and 35 seconds that we've got. Um, so I'm going to look to the audience, and I don't know if we've got any mics or if I should bring the mic down. We've got some people with mics. Excellent. Would you pop your hand up if you've got a query, question, or, or a comment? Just briefly introduce yourself, if that's all right. Hello, I'm, I'm Mary. I call myself a citizen improver, whatever that is. Um, and mine is more of a comment and maybe a question, because I think, perhaps particularly to Dom, I think the issue around the word population is often challenging in this, because actually people don't live in populations. They live in communities, neighborhoods, villages, streets, suburbs. And I think one of the challenges to get away from the notion of population health to something that resonates with your parents, with ordinary people, about where they live and where they belong. Um, and I think, I think the real challenge is to bring the word community much more to the fore when we're trying to do community-wide change. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think we've We've drawn on some of the history that has come up around improvement and the triple aim where that kind of language and wording is already there. But as I said, the stars of the show, the people who actually talk about the people and the communities and thinking about who that relates to. So uh, whilst we've borrowed that language, I think it should only be something that we temporarily draw people in through because that's the lens they already know. But if we were to move much more into communities, people, citizens, life, health, well-being, that would be excellent. So absolutely point well made. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Has anyone else got a um, question or a comment that they'd like to make? One here at the front, next to Mary. 
it's infectious. <laughs> Sorry about this, yeah. Tom, Tom Ling, uh, heading up the evaluation for RAND Europe. I'm really interested with having um, four clinicians on the panel who have managed to unfreeze their relationship with their professional identity or their primary professional identity. And I'm just really interested in how they've managed to achieve that and what, what led them to leave behind that particular professional sense of, of, of who I am and to, and to unfreeze that. Thank you. So, Goody, do you want to say Yeah, um, so that's a, an excellent question and the thing that I've been pondering for <laughs> quite a long time. But um, I think the thing that has driven us individually, and I'll let Hannah speak for herself, is ultimately we're not de uh, defined by our professions, right? We, we start out as human beings first, and we, have, we come with our own set of values and things that we believe in. And you know, I'm lucky that my job allows me to actually act out most of my values, usually in line with the way that I, I think that they should be <laughs> acted out. But I think that actually what we are trying to develop here is um, the professional capacity to be able to stand up to um, directives from organizations, institutions, governments that you may not agree with. And we should be allowed to, to do that within our professional remits. We should be allowed to understand our own moral code and redefine it if we have to, if we don't feel like it's being set out in a way that we agree with. And I think that's partly what this work is about, is about saying that, look, no one has asked us to think about this stuff. It's not part of our job description on paper, but ultimately, you know, even if you didn't care about population health, public health, whatever, morally, it's just, it's not okay to let that stuff happen in front of you day in, day out, when you, when, you know, you can see the effects of it. So I think, I think it's, it ultimately comes down to being a human being and uh, allowing that part of you to, to come to fruition. Do you want to say anything, Hannah or Claire? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think um, you've put it really, really well. And like, I think personally for me, the motivation of doing this work, um, is very much from my own moral code. Um, I'm a Christian, and I strongly believe that we should be um, helping everyone, especially those who are vulnerable and marginalized. And it's such a privilege to be able to do that with the work I do as a doctor using QI tools. Um, and I was, back in the day, I was in the Q founding cohort, and it's really great to be able to use those tools for this purpose. Um, and that is just such a privilege um, for each patient that we help doing this. Thank you. I think it's a great question um, because there is something um, about being willing to be radical um, and, and rock the boat, which is why I, I love um, Helen Bevan's work ar around um, you know, disruption and, and how do we do that and yet stay in the boat, um, stay connected um, and work collectively. Um, I, I think we have a strong tradition um, across health and care, social care professions of, of being champions for social justice. Um, I was working with a group of uh, older health visitors recently, and they said that you know in the 1980s, they used to call themselves anarchists in cardigans. <laughs> I just thought that was lovely. I, I, you know, I love the idea of being an anarchist in a cardigan, particularly as I, as I get older, and I'm rather fond of good knitwear. Um, but, um, I think it's really important that we give one another permission uh, to speak up um, and to speak out. Um, so, so yeah, I, I don't think it's about leaving behind a professional identity. I think it's stepping into uh, a true professional identity, which is about advocacy, um, about speaking up for the marginalized, about speaking up uh, for those whose voices are seldom heard. Um, because we see them, you know, we are out there day after day working with uh, the people who perhaps the rest of society doesn't often see. So that is our professional role. It is our, you know, our duty and our identity. Tom, we're really interested in the Health Foundation about this. So we're um, doing some in-house research at the moment, looking at our improvement teams who have tackled uh, problems that sit in the social determinant space or started working in a different way. So for example, um, uh, you know, clinical teams who are respiratory focused, who've looked at patients who come in with 
um, breathlessness and said, actually, what's going on at home with the damp housing, the anxiety and the other things that we need to focus on? So we're looking at, as individuals, what does it take for those people who've decided that they want to tackle those broader things and also what's the context in their organisations, their settings and the other levers that have helped and enabled that so that we can help spread some of that learning more widely as well because there's particular groups of people who've taken this on compared to others who haven't yet managed to so we're trying to understand what that what it is that's innate and what's in the situation that helps people do that thank you very much i think we've probably run out of time for questions um but i just want to leave you with a few things for you to take away with you a few questions for you to ponder for the rest of the day when you go back to your workplaces um and to thank you very much for joining this session, for engaging with a lot of acronyms, some individual letters, pirates. Uh, we've crossed over into cardigans. So we've covered a lot of ground. Um, and it just remains to say one last big thank you to the speakers. And please do stay in touch as we take this work forwards um, over the next years. Thank you very much.